going back to the bench. Okay, so we have the, I'm in the middle of 90 different projects right now. And of course, that's when Murphy comes along and says, hey, let's break your washing machine. And I'm thinking, well, it's too bad I don't know some kind of a technician or somebody who works on things. And I was like, oh yeah, I do. So I'm not exactly my forte, but I found some interesting things while I was tearing apart this washing machine. And one of those was this. Now, I've actually, I'm still working on it, uh, but this is a door switch. Now, this is apparently, according to the interwebs, a very common failure uh, on washing machines is this this door switch or door switches in particular uh, and can result in all kinds of things but it's not really the door switch that I'm interested in it's actually this thing right here now this is something new to me I, I probably heard the term once or twice but I never really looked into it because I would always look at this as hey this is just a door switch the door switch either works or it doesn't and if it doesn't we make it go away and we put a new one in I never actually tore them apart while well, I decided yeah I'm going to learn something I'm going to tear this apart and and I found this wax motor and I'm trying to talk quick because I want to make sure I get through this now uh before my meters start to shut off uh and my timer and everything else so a wax motor if you're not familiar uh this thing right here can be used in places where you would normally use a solenoid but they're taking advantage of a uh it's it's a a wax motor by definition I guess is, is a linear actuator device that converts thermal energy into mechanical energy um, and the reason is because if if wax apparently expands at a pretty predict uh, predictable rate depending on the temperatures it's exposed to so uh, 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 average uh, 5 to 20 percent so that's actually pretty predictable and according to what I've read these are used in aerospace uh, for things like fuel controls and uh, oil controls, that kind of stuff. Uh, and, and apparently they're more cost effective than solenoids, especially in moist environments where you would have uh, rust and things like that occurring and could inhibit the product, the product's performance. So these are actually pretty, pretty neat. And there's not much to them. There's an enclosed volume of wax that's inside here. There's a little canister, uh, a little uh, housing. Uh, and there's a plunger attached to it. I know you can't see it, but I've got this all hooked up because it's, it's kind of fascinating to watch this work. Uh, and then there's a heat source. Well, you need a heat source, some kind of a, usually an electric current or um, through a resistive element or maybe a PTC thermistor. That'd be probably a pretty accurate way of doing it. Uh, and then it also has a heat sink in there. Uh, and you need a spring or some other means of, of applying a biasing force to push the plunger back when you're done using it. So essentially what happens is that the, you pass 120 volts through this, this one's wired for 120, and it's going to push the plunger uh, forward. Uh, it doesn't happen instantaneously, but it's, it's very linear and it's smooth and predictable, and it's got kind of a delay to it. Now, if you think about that washing machine, apparently these are really common on washing machine doors and, and, and detergent dispenser doors, that kind of thing. Uh, where they want there to be a delayed reaction. They don't want you to cut the power and be able to yank the door open right away because you could get injured. So uh, this is that aggravating thing that makes it so you can't open your, your washer door while the, while the drum is still spinning. Not sure why you would, but you know, you do you. So essentially what I'm going to do here is I've got this kind of set up and I'm going to hit the timer. Hopefully we keep everything on. And I've got the voltage hooked up, ready to go, and we're going to time how long it takes to this to open. So the plunger is right here, and its job in this circuit is to close a set of contacts. So if you're looking at this video because you found it because of the part, this is this would normally be like on top of this. So kind of, I'm not sure if you can kind of tell what it looks like, uh, but it's basically closing a set of contacts right here, and then there is another set of contacts underneath this section. This is one portion of it. Uh, and when the housing is enclosed, the door switch uh, actuator is is goes into this hole. This is the other side of it. Uh, and so this pin would go up here. It would push on a paddle that would rock this. And that's going to remove a lock, if that makes sense. Um, this is going to energize. There's a pin here. There's a coil. Uh, it's going to energize that coil, which essentially is going to turn it into what? A magnet, right? That magnet is going to attract this metal plate. It's going to pull down on it, but it can't make contact because this actuator has a rod on it, okay? 
and it's locking this thing in place until it actually comes forward and pushes that down. You're not going to make contact. So that is, is essentially what's going on. This is basically controlling two different contactors. One set right here that it's pushing with a little leverage. So I've got a multimeter. Uh, this one's hooked up to um, voltage. This one's hooked up to continuity. And the continuity is we're testing across this set of contacts. I'm not going to worry about this one because we can't put the housing on top to actually see it. So let's go ahead and get ready. I will flip on the power and hit the timer. And the race is on. So if we watch this meter, I'm, I just can't set this up so that you can get a really good view of this actually closing. Um, but it's right here. So, but you might be able to see this little thing move. So we're 21 seconds in. I know, captivating, huh? And she's moving. And we should be able to see this contactor close. And we'll see that we're going to have continuity. So there we go. Just like that, our switch is now closed. And of course, it would be as it's moving, it's pushing down on this metal plate. I know you really can't see that. But it's it would be pushing down on this metal plate if the housing was on top. And it's going to close the other contactor. So... That is basically how this thing works. And I took this thing apart because I think that that's at full motion. I didn't really, I'll have to go back and look at the video and I forgot that I was timing it. Um, let's go ahead and kill the power and see how long it takes to retract. Okay, so we're a couple seconds off, no biggie. But right now, I mean, it's really got that contactor bent way over. Um, so we're just kind of letting it cool off. And as it cools, it should be retracting uh, because there is a spring in here while this is doing its thing. There is a spring up in the collar. So there's the heat element back here, uh, or, or the, uh, the actual enclosed volume of wax inside of that little tube. It has a plunger on the end of it. Oop, it's got a plunger on the end of it. And as it's uh, retracting, or is it, it's pushing forward, it's compressing a spring. So that's going to give it some biasing force. And then the plunger, of course, is going to make its way out. And then as this thing cools down, it's going to do the, the, that biasing spring is going to be pushing back against it. And it's going to start to retract, which it's retracting. So if we watch, hopefully that wire isn't covering, we should see this contact open up any second. There it goes. So that is actually pretty clever. And it just took just over a minute to do that. And that's kind of what I've seen from other people looking at this is, you know, about a minute for these types of switches. So essentially they're doing this so that your cycle can run on your washer. And, and after the power is disconnected, it's still going to take some time to be able to disable that latch. So, uh, and I know a lot of people who like to yank on those things when they're uh, still spinning down. So the other thing is, is that if there is a power loss to the to the unit, you're not going to be able to to overcome that safety. So I, I find this actually really fascinating. And I also learned some things about what's called a pressure level switch, but that's for a different video. So I guess just quickly, the failure points on this are I, I don't really see what can go wrong with the wax motor. I mean, I guess there's a couple of things. There is a resistive element. I had thought about taking this apart, but I don't really want to do that. Uh, there's just not really a lot to see. There's just a little capsule in there. It's got a resistive element. Uh, it, it, they say they're mister, but it looked to me more like a resistor. Um, and, it, and it is attached to a, a, a small heat sink. Um, and that's going to provide that thermal exchange to heat that wax up. Then you have the plunger that comes basically straight out of that tube on the inside. And then you have the compression or biasing spring. Uh, and then this assembly snaps together. There's not really a whole lot in there. As a matter of fact, the the connectors, uh, the bladed connectors that we have are actually like the clawed type and they're bent and they're just holding that in place. It just snaps right in there. There's nothing else holding it. Uh, and then you have the outer housing and that's it. So this just clips onto the plunger um, uh, and rides in the molded plastic. They're, it's very simple. It's pretty clever. Uh, 
so there is there are these contacts I guess if you're trying to fix this you would want to like instead of buying a new switch and I can understand that uh, this these are the things that I would look at these contactors are filthy like when I took it apart uh, they were filthy and I cleaned them up with a little bit of deoxid and then I adjusted them to make sure that they were going to actually close when that plunger was extended uh, the coil uh, which is on the uh, underneath here uh, I believe this pin and this pin are connected uh, I can see how those could get nasty over time and start to degrade and you would probably lose some uh, continuity there or, or total loss of continuity would be my guess um, so you would want to make sure that that wire is is definitely soldered to each one of these um, and check the resistance around the coil also the little coil windings of course forgot I don't really know if that I haven't looked at the circuit to see if that would be possible but you, I guess with any coil you could probably pull a little bit too much amperage and it would degrade the enamel coating which would cause a short and wouldn't work right uh, and then the second set of contactors again here's one uh, strip here's another thing um, well look uh, Katie's on her way so we have all these things kind of going on here uh, that I would check just to make sure that there's continuity across these strips but it's actually once you kind of break it down it's a pretty simple switch you would just want to make sure that this thing is able to rock all your springs are in place that they're lined up properly and then mechanically operate it manually to see okay is are the all these things doing it you could you could you could uh, connect across here with a multimeter or an ohms meter as I'm doing and check to make sure that you have contact across the contacts uh, uh, on both sets and then you would check that coil for continuity and then check to make sure that your springs are all in location and if everything is there present and working manually then the only thing left would be this uh, wax motor and you would very easily I'm not recommending that you do this if you don't like playing with voltage please don't do it again uh, your brain is the best thing that you can use and that's how we uh, you know try to not die uh, this is a uh, this is fairly simple to test though should you have the gumption to do so so look the again the timing might be a little bit off with the audio I'm still working on finding a better way to sync the audio up but it's it's just really tricky with the program I'm using I'm probably gonna have to get a better program and coming soon I don't know if you can see it in the background there's our volt vacuum tube voltmeter chassis uh, the rest of it would you like a sneak peek I don't know if I should show you the faceplate yet but I'm kind of excited. It's not uh, It's not complete. I guess I could give it. Look, if you don't want a spoiler, if you don't want to see it before, look away, and I'll show it for just a few seconds, and I'll tell you when you can look back. Sound like a plan? Okay, here we go. I'm going to show it in three, two, one. Yeah. Now, I intentionally left... Ooh, I intentionally left this portion up here uncleaned, just to show you the difference. But it is cleaning up very very nicely so we still have a lot of work to do and we're still going through the chassis I'm still ordering parts I have uh, uh, let's see the vacuum tube voltmeter the um, the radio is still being worked on uh, we're still testing some other means of repairs to make sure we're doing it correctly uh, there's just there's a lot uh, going on in the lab right now and of course with this washer breaking down I just couldn't not take the opportunity to start working on this and clean this up so okay uh, if you have any more questions maybe just throw them down in the comments and hopefully somebody else will, will answer them if I if I get back this way if I know the answer I will do my best uh, and in the meantime uh, this was just a quick and dirty video and I hope it explained the part a little bit and kind of how it works so uh, we'll see you next time and don't mimic the monkey